could read Psalm 119.89 right here. All right, and then Psalm 119.140. Anybody else? Psalm 119.1 right in the back. Uh, some, Psalm 119.160. All right. And then John 17.17. 17. Anybody else? All right, got it. We got all four. All right, so <clears throat> let's look at these verses as we start out. Psalm 119.89. Amen. 140. <clears throat> sorry. That's all right. Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. Okay, then 160. Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endure forever. Amen. John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is true. Okay, so all of those... Uh, verses help us to understand a little bit of our topic this morning. And so you'll notice in our handout, the topic this morning is, can I trust my Bible? So you'll have, uh, sometimes, you'll have people, maybe it could be soul winning, but even in Christian circles, there'll be people that question the Bible. They'll, they'll say, well, you know, how do, how do you really know? How do you really know? And so one of the things that we have, have to understand when it comes to spiritual things is what does the Bible say we live by? Who can answer that one? What do we live by? And this is a spiritual term. It's found in 1 Corinthians. We live by faith and not by sight. In fact, the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 11 that if you don't have faith, it's impossible to please him. So faith is one of those things where I am trusting in God. I'm resting in God. So I rest in God in my salvation, but then I also rest in God when he tells me something. So what does God tell us about his word? Well, you already saw that in those verses. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled. All right, where is it settled? It's settled in heaven. You say, well, I'm living here on earth. Well, then I can trust and we'll go through this in this, uh, it's, it's a simple lesson, I would say. Um, there are some points that might be a little bit deeper, okay? Um, but we'll try, to, we'll try to make it as uh, simple as possible because the, the Bible issue, you can, you can study that, I would say, for years, right? And, and some do, we should. We should study the Bible all the time. But the devil at the very beginning of human existence. What do we know in Genesis chapter three? What did he do and start questioning? God's word. Right away, did, did God really say that? Did, did God say? And so, if he can get us to start questioning God, things start crumbling, all right? But God is not like man. You know what I can tell you about man? The good, the, the best people that we all may know, guess what they are still? Sinners. We're all sinners, but God's not. And so that's good to understand. There, there's a debate, uh, there's been a debate about the Bible from the beginning of time. I would say uh, the devil has always been questioning God's word. And we saw that in Genesis chapter three. There's a, a poem that I, I like. It's, um, it's attributed to a man named John Clifford. And so just pay attention to it. It's called The Anvil of God's Word. It says this, last eve, I paused behind the blacksmith's door and heard the anvil ring, the vesper chime. So you know what an anvil is? An anvil is that big uh, thing that they're hammering on the blacksmith, all right? So that's the anvil. He heard the anvil ring, the vesper chime. Then looking in, I saw upon the floor old hammers worn with beating years of time. How many anvils have you, said I, to wear and batter all these hammers so? Just one, said he. Then with a twinkling eye, the anvil wears the hammers out, you know. And so I thought the anvil of God's word. For ages, skeptics, blows have beaten upon. Yet though the noise of falling blows was heard, the anvil is unharmed, the hammer, hammer's gone. All right, so 
over time, I, I like that poem because it, it shares the idea that over time, guess what has happened? Critics have come and critics have, uh, will come again and they'll blow upon the anvil of God's word. But you know what I have found? The anvil of God's word, it's still here. Amen. And the critics are gone. And so this morning, I just want to take just quickly four things as far as four ideas about can I trust my Bible? All right, so the first one in your handout, you can trust the text. That's T-E-X-T, -E all right? You can trust the text. So right at the get-go is where we're going to get maybe a little heavier and you'll fall asleep, get your nap in, all right, then wake up on point two uh, so that you're wide awake for the rest of the uh, remainder of the Sunday school class and then into the next hour, and then you can take a little nap uh, during uh, the next uh, message too, all right? So you can trust the text. All right, what do we mean by that? So the two things to understand, the first one, letter A, there are two families of text, okay? So let me just put it simply, we put it in families. So let's say that you have a family tree. All right, in a family tree, normally you have a mom and dad and the mom and dad, you can trace this family, you know, back to Ireland, or you can tra trace, um, like if some of you, let's say you're a husband, you can trace your, your wife's family tree back to like some alien uh, place out there. All right, just kidding. All right, but uh, you, can trace, you can trace your family tree. So when it comes to the text, what's interesting is the Bible, the King James Bible, what you will hear uh, all right, so let's first review some things. So the Old Testament is written in what? Hebrew. The New Testament majority is written in what? Greek. Greek. All right, and so you have a little bit of Aramaic, but it's basically Greek. So you have Hebrew and Greek. And so you have uh, way back, you know, in the, the Hebrew, uh, you would have papyri. Uh, then you have um, these, these texts. All right, um, and, and a lot of them are a little portions of the text. But what's interesting is you only have two families of the text. And the two families, this is what's interesting, the King James Bible, which we hold, comes from one family. And basically, all the other translations, now the, the New King James claims that it, it, it also has come from the same as the King James, but through study, some of it, what they did is they went to the other family to get some of it. So the King James basically has one family and it's called the received text, or you'll hear it as the majority text. And there's guys that have done studies that are awesome at Greek and Hebrew and all that, and they've done studies and this is what they found. This was uh, way back. There was a, a, a couple of men that did studies in the uh, late 1800s and the mid 1900s. They've done some now recently in the late, late 1900s, the early 2000s. And this is what they found. All right, so you have all these pieces, all right? Because um, you know, you're talking thousands of years that they've copied the Bible. Okay, so they, uh, some of them are just portions of scripture, but the received text, all right, this is what's amazing. In the 1960s, 98 to 99% of all of the text agreed with the received text. One to 2%, so this was in the 1960s, one to 2% agreed with the other. And so what they did is certain guys were like, you know what, we're gonna choose the other. So they chose one to 2% to make a Bible out of. And the received text had agreement with 98 to 99%. Now to me, that seems kind of silly. So I'm gonna choose, it seems like you just are argumentative. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to be part of the majority. All right? Now, I understand that when you're talking about the world, but I'm talking about the Bible here. And so, the, the King James Bible that we hold, 
90, you know, and now it could be they found some other ones. So it could be 95 now or 96, but 96% of all of the documents that have found agree with the King James Bible. You know what? I can trust my text. I can trust my text. The second thing I say, uh, the questionable reliability of some of the other texts. All right, so uh, remember back in September, back in September, uh, I came with uh, Dr. Sorensen, Dave Sorensen, and he came. So he's one of the experts uh, in our world, I would say, on the King James issue. So he wrote a book, maybe some of you bought it, that was entitled Neither Oldest Nor Best. So in that book, he studied for years on this. So there are two texts. Remember that um, you have the 99, whatever, and then you have the one or two percent. All right. So that two percent, 90 like eight percent of it comes from two texts called the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus, okay? He believes both of those are fake. Both. So, oh, so wait a minute. All right, and part of that is, all right, so the Vaticanus, so it, 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 there's a little clue there of where that came from, the Catholics. So the Vaticanus, this is what's interesting. You know what's completely missing in the Vaticanus? The pastoral epistles. The pastoral epistles are 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus. Now, what's interesting is who's forgetting those? The Catholics. You know what 1st and Timothy and Titus talk about? Qualifications of a pastor, husband of one wife. All right, and also in that passage said, watch out for those that come up with weird doctrines like avoiding certain meats. All right, think of all the things that are in Timothy and Titus, and it says, um, it, it's saying all these things in the Vatican, it's just, oh, we, uh, we don't think that's part of Scripture. So it's not shocking that Catholics would think that that shouldn't be part of Scripture. But I want all Scripture to be part of Scripture. Okay, so, uh, and the first thing, all right, so that was the little deeper one, is, uh, why can I trust my Bible? One, I can trust the text. God said he's going to preserve it for us. All right, so then look at number two. Look at number two in our uh, handout. You can trust, here's God's, our, our big word, God's providential preservation. You can trust God's providential preservation. So what do we mean by providence? Providence is God's hand working through men. It's God's hand. You can trust God's providential preservation. So you can trust God's work. You can trust God's work. And what do we mean by that? So we use a term uh, when we talk about scripture, we talk about um, the inerrancy. Have you ever uh, heard people say that the Bible is inerrant? All right, so uh, normally when we use the word inerrant, we're meaning that it is, um, it is truthful, it's without error. But this is what's interesting. It's a, and that's a, a correct description. Yet earlier believers... Remember, the King James was written, uh, you're talking of uh, those that studied English in the 1500s and 1600s and 1700s. All right, so uh, English does change and some ideas of words change over time. So listen to what, during the time of the King James translation, the word inerrant had two ideas. It had a definition with astronomy and it had a definition with royalty, okay? The idea of inerrancy. So in astronomy, inerrant meant a star on a straight, unwavering path, right? A star on a straight, unwavering path. In 
royal terms, it described a knight who remained loyal to his king's side was inerrant as opposed to knights who were errant and were constantly always doing their own thing. So think about that. When they were writing the Bible and they said the Bible was inerrant, they were saying it was like a star that was on a path. Who, des who decided that path? God did. They also described it in the idea of that royalty. It, the Bible was like something that uh, you could trust. You know, not some, you know, night that was off and every once in a while the king would say, do this or that, and he'd be like, yeah, I guess I'll do that too. No, it was a loyal, the Bible is loyal to God. We can trust God's providential preservation. Why? We can trust God's work. Our Bible is not or tampered with by philosophers, the Catholic Church, um, people that cor uh, completely corrupted the manuscripts. It came to us on a straight path, cared for by the local church and translated in a way that would not change the text. You know, we can trust God's timing and putting the King James Bible together, too. You know, there really hasn't been a group of men. If you study the putting together, I don't know if you've studied the history of the King James. Uh, one of the books that I would highly recommend, there's a, a man named Dr. David Brown. And Dr. David Brown, you can look it up. It's, it's a pretty expensive book if you look it up. Uh, but it's called The Indestructible Bible. And The Indestructible Bible is about a 450-page book on the history of the King James. All right, and really, not just the King James, but he goes all the way back and he talks about in the first century and second century, and he talks about how God preserved the Bible for us. It's just awesome. But when you come to that time of the King James, all right, and King James wasn't necessarily, all right, most of the guys, when you read about them, as far as the translators and all that, uh, you're going to find Puritans, you're going to find Anglicans. Uh, you're not going to find any Catholics because Catholics didn't really want the Bible brought into um, the modern. He, they didn't want it in our language. All right? They wanted the select few so that the average person had to sit there and be like, oh, I wonder what they're saying. All right, but what did like Wycliffe and Tyndale, remember those guys? What did they say? Um, I can't remember the Wycliffe or Tyndale that basically said that he wanted every plowboy to have the Bible in his language. Why were they doing that? Because they knew that God wanted all of us individually. It's one of the things that we uh, love as being Baptists. We call it the priesthood of the believer. I don't have to go through somebody else to get to God. I don't have to go through somebody else to understand God's word. Now, I understand there's a church and there's teachers. Remember, the Bible says that. God gives the, the church pastors and teachers. He gives all that. I understand that. But I don't have to go through somebody to get to God. And that's why God says, I'm going to give you the word of God. And he, uh, and actually in the time when the King James came together, it was just amazing what God brought together, the men that God brought together for the translation and the wisdom that they had. You know, they had separate teams. Uh, there, was, there was basically, uh, I can't remember the, the three groups, all right? But there was an Oxford group, there was a Cambridge group, and there was another group. I, and then they divided that group even in half, so there is teams of six. All, right, all these teams, and they would work on it, work on it, they'd come back together, and then they'd swap, study it, they would um, uh, hash over some of these things and say, well, no, 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 this is what it means. It was amazing how God brought that together. Why? Because you can trust God's providential preservation. That's what he's doing for us. Why? Because he said he'd do it. So can I trust my Bible? Well, yes. I can trust what? I can trust the text. Second, I can trust 
God's providential preservation. And I gave you a couple of points under, under there, the word inerrant. Also, uh, in the timing and putting the King James translators together. So let's go to point number three. You can trust God's promises. You can trust God's promises. So at the bottom, uh, you're going to see some blanks as far as uh, some spots to put some references. That's where we're going to use some uh, spots here. The first thing I want you to think about, though, is what do we mean by you can trust God's promises? So let's do this again. I'm going to read. I'll read some verses, but I want to uh, have uh, some of you look up a uh, passage. All right. So let's first uh, let's have somebody read Isaiah 7:14. Isaiah 7:14 in the back. You read Isaiah 7:14, and I'm going to read the counter to you in just a moment. Uh, let's have somebody read Micah 5:2. Right over here, Micah 5:2. Then um, could I have somebody read? Jeremiah 31:15. Yes, Jeremiah 31:15. I'll read those again. Isaiah 7:14 is in the back, Micah 5:2, Jeremiah 31:15. And let's do another one, uh, Zechariah 9:9. 9, 9. Zechariah. Anybody want that one? Or do I need to do that one? All right, you got it. Zechariah, not Zach. Zechariah 9:9. 9, 9. All right, so let's go. And I'm going to read, all right, so these are all promises in the Old Testament. All right, did you notice all those are Old Testament passages? So let's read those, Isaiah 7, 14, first of all. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Okay, so what does the Bible say in Isaiah? That there is going to be... A virgin, all right, and most of us know that without getting crude, it means that it's it's a lady that has never known a man uh, in a physical way. And that that lady then is going to have a baby, and it's going to be Jesus. All right, so listen to Matthew chapter 1. So this is hundreds of years, hundreds of years before Matthew 1, 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph. What is that saying? She's a virgin. So guess what happened? Hundreds of years before it said, there's going to be a, a lady named Mary, or not Mary, but a virgin, that's going to bear a child, and that's going to be Emmanuel, God with us. And guess what happened? It happened. All right, let's then read Micah 5.2. Micah 5 2. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Okay, so here we have, again, hundreds of years beforehand, it says that not only is there going to be a, a young lady, a virgin, that is going to have a child, and it's going to be Jesus. It's also specific to the town. And where is that? Well, Matthew chapter 2 and verse 1 says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. Now what's interesting is, were they, did they live there? No. They lived way up in Galilee. All right, so I've had the privilege of going over to Jerusalem and Israel a couple of times. And Galilee, all right, now, we usually rent a bus. I'm not walking or riding donkeys, all right? Uh, and guess what? It takes a number of hours in a travel bus to get from Nazareth to Bethlehem. So walking, yeah, it'd be a long hike, Okay. It'd be, it'd be high. But guess what God did? He said, it's going to be in Bethlehem, and it happened. It's amazing. Okay? So then let's go to, what do we have? Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31 and verse 15. Thus 
okay? So this is, it's, it sounds a little confused, but it's talking about uh, almost like a group of people wailing and crying out because something horrible is happening to their kids. Oh, wait a minute. We know where that is. It's talking about Matthew chapter 2. Listen to verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coast thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men, then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy or Jeremiah, the prophet saying, in Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning. So here, hundreds of years before, Jeremiah says, guess what's gonna happen? Not only is Jesus gonna be born, and all these prophecies, all right, did you notice it's Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Micah. They're different people even. All talking about the same thing with accuracy. With accuracy hundreds of years before. All right, so then we said one more, I believe. It was, uh, which one was, Ze Zechariah. Zechariah 9.9. 9, 9, 9. All right, so what does that sound like? It is a fulfillment in Matthew chapter 21 of Jesus. Remember, we call it Palm Sunday. We're coming up to it, you know, with Easter coming. Sometimes, I know of some churches, they celebrate Palm Sunday and they have the kids walk in and they're waving palm branches and stuff like that. So Palm Sunday, what is it? It's Jesus riding in on a donkey. Matthew 21, uh, he's talking to his disciples, and he says, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. And then later, he rides in to the city of Jerusalem, and what are they doing? They're crying out, Hosanna. All right, and then, a few days later, what are they doing? Crucifying them. All right, so, I go back to it. Can I trust my Bible? I can trust my Bible. Why? Because I can trust the text. I can trust God's providential preservation. Then, I can trust God's promises. So, I, I do all of that because, let me give you a couple of verses that will help you with this. If you want to write them down in that scripture references, and I'll read them, all right? Psalm 12, 6 and 7. Psalm 12, 6 and 7. I'm going to give you a couple others. And I have more than this, but I just want to uh, make let you see that the Bible says and promises that he'll keep his words. Psalm 33 and verse 11. Psalm 33 and verse 11. Psalm 119 and verse 152. Psalm 119 and verse 152. Isaiah 40 and verse 8. Isaiah 40 and verse 8. And then the last one I'll give you one is, is Matthew 24, 35. Matthew 24, 35. So let me read some of those. We're going to go in reverse order. So I'll read Matthew 24, 35 first. It says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Does that sound like a promise? Yeah. Yeah. Isaiah 40, uh, I mean, Isaiah 40 and verse 8, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand, how long? A little bit? Forever. Forever. Then Psalm 119, 152, concerning thy testimonies. So what does the word testimonies mean? It means the Bible. Concerning thy testimonies, I have known of old that thou hast founded them forever. 
Psalm 33, verse 11, the counsel of the Lord standeth forever. The thoughts of his heart to all generation. Then Psalm 12, 6 and 7, this is my favorite verse on uh, the promise of God concerning his word. Psalm 12, 6 and 7, the words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Now listen to what he says. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. And listen, it says, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So who says he's going to keep his words? God. So, you know, I understand uh, and I'm, I'm appreciative of people that study the Word of God. I believe God puts people together and puts it in their heart and says, hey, let's stand and let's make sure God uses men. Didn't he use men? And 2 Peter chapter 1, we read that um, that's just the, the balance of understanding that God uses men, but it's ultimately God because holy men of God were moved by what? The Holy Ghost. So God does use men, but God says, you know what? I'm going to have men and I'll use men, but ultimately it's on me. I'll keep God's word. So can I trust my Bible? Yeah. You know why? Because who said he's got it? God. God. God said he's got it. So when the devil comes, and really the devil also uses men, he uses men. He gets in the hearts of men, and he starts getting people to doubt God. All right? Uh, we see that in the area of salvation all the time. Has the devil tricked people in the area of salvation? Oh, yeah, he's done a pretty good job at it. Because there's a whole lot of people that think that church gets them there, or their works gets them there, or their baptism gets them there, or a whole bunch of things. If I pay enough money, that gets me there. And why, why are all those ideas out there? Because the devil gets people away from trusting what? God's word. God's word. So can I trust my Bible? Yes, I can. Why? Because I can trust the text. I can trust God's providential preservation. I can also trust God's promises. Does God lie? No, he doesn't. So let's go to our last point, and we'll be done for this morning. All right, so we have three positives. You can trust God's, or you can trust the text. You can trust God's providential preservation. You can trust God's promise. And we, then we have a negative. You can't trust man. <laughs> All right? You can't trust man. Does the Bible bear that out? Oh, yeah, it does. I don't like this a lot. You know what? Because I want, I want you to know, and you're probably already thinking, you're like, you know what, but we can trust you. Yeah, of course. All right. I mean, of course. All right, but guess what the Bible tells us about man? Yeah, and he's not a, man's not good. There's none that doeth good. All right, there's none that is righteous. Now, I understand that at some point upon salvation, then I am righteous, but guess what? It's still not me. It's Christ's righteousness imputed to me. It, it, he, he imparts his righteousness to me. He takes he takes my bad. So what are some scriptural references about man? All right, here's a, a couple of them. I knocked that off. Sorry about that, guy. <laughs> knocked your little fuzzy off there. All right, so uh, some of these you know. What does Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 say? So if you want to write it down, you, can, you can't trust man. So Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. And all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. So what is the Bible telling us? Don't lean on yourself. Why? I mean, uh, am I a good person? We all want to say that. But the Bible doesn't seem to indicate that. Here's another verse. If you're wanting to uh, know about man's ideas or what God thinks of man, Proverbs 14 and verse 14. Proverbs 14 and verse 14. Listen to what it says. The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. 
and a good man shall be satisfied from himself. Listen to Proverbs 28 and verse 26. Proverbs 28 and verse 26. He that trusteth in his own heart is a really good guy. Nope. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. Ouch. Hmm. Isn't that what the world says? I mean, hasn't Disney said that for years? Follow your heart. Yeah, it's evil. All right. I guess that why uh, those that you know really are running after Disney are evil. All right. Oops. All right. But anyways, uh, uh, Jeremiah seventeen nine. What does Jeremiah seventeen nine say? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Now listen to the next verse. So, so the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? Then it tells us who can know it. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins. All right, that's, that's our God. So what is God saying? Be careful. You know, when man gets involved with things, normally he messes things up, doesn't he? So when man gets involved in salvation, guess what he starts doing? He comes up with his own ideas, comes up with his own thoughts as far as how you get saved, and he messes it up because salvation, now I'm not saying salvation is easy. You know why? Uh, you know, we, we have tracks that say the simple plan of salvation. It is simple. It's not necessarily easy. Why? Because man likes to do things his own way. Man likes to be like, well, I, I got this. I got this. But it's simple. That's why sometimes it's hard for people. You're like, so this is all you have to do. Trust in Christ. Like, no, there's got to be something more. Well, yeah, you got to beat yourself. you got to give X amount of dollars. Like, no, 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 you don't do that. What you have to do is trust in Christ. That's why it's simple. But it's not necessarily easy. Why? Because man wants to, when he gets involved with things, he messes things up. So, I can't trust man. Uh, James chapter 1 and verse 26. James chapter 1. So, this is a, a New Testament passage. James chapter 1 and verse 26. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religious, uh, religion is vain. What is it saying? That man... Man can be deceived in his own heart. That's man. So I can trust God, but I can't necessarily trust man. So scriptural, you, can, you can't trust man. And you see some scriptural references about man. And then even, uh, I don't have all the list that's here. Um, I thought, oh yeah, I do have some. Okay. Uh, if you want to turn to uh, Matthew, uh, turn to Matthew chapter 1. I'm going to give you just a couple just in the Gospels here. The Gospels here. Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Look at verse 25. It says, And knew her not till she had brought forth her what? And he called his name Jesus. You see that word firstborn? Most of the other translations, they pull it out. Don't, is that kind of important? Yeah, it is. I mean, it's just a son. I mean, if it's just a son, she could have had other sons before, couldn't she have? Which means she's not a virgin, which means that the scripture's not fulfilled. To me, that's an important word. Why pull it out? Um... All right, let, uh, look at uh, Matthew 6.33. Most of us know this. But seek ye first. All right, but guess what uh, most other translations pull up? It says, but seek ye first the kingdom. Of what? I mean, are there other kingdoms? Is there a kingdom of man? Yeah, there is. I think maybe having God there is pretty important. Um, let's, uh, let's go to Matthew 9, verse 13. 
Matthew 9, verse 13. All right, I'm showing this to you that you can't trust man. When man gets involved, guess what he starts doing? He starts messing with the words of God. Matthew 9, 13 says this. Um, for, but go ye, learn what that meaneth. I'll have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not call, uh, I am not come, all right, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to what? So guess what the other translations pull out? But I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners, and it stops. Um. Is repentance pretty important in the Bible? Yes. yes, very important. It is It is a doctrine in Scripture. What did Christ, what did John the Baptist preach? What did Christ preach? First thing, his message, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Seems like it's pretty important. The, um, uh, and there's tons, all right, uh, turn to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew 18. Matthew 18. I'm just going to do one last one because I know we need to be done here. But what I'm trying to show you is you can't trust man when it comes to Scripture. All right, so here's the, at the same time came the disciples unto Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He going through, uh, if you know uh, the passage, Jesus then says, uh, if your eye offend thee, that's uh, verse 7. 8, 9, 10. Look at verse 10. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. Look at verse 11. What does it say? I'm to save that which was lost. Guess what the other translations do? Verse 10, and it goes to verse 12. Um, is that a pretty important verse? For the Son of Man is... Come to save that which was lost. You know what? I'd like to know that. Why is that not in Scripture? Oh, it's not important. Because the 1% to 2% said it wasn't there. The 90-something percent said it was. Then put it there. You know why? Because all of God's words matter. All of God's words matter. On the back... This was a, a pastor, pastor friend, all right? I wouldn't say he was a close friend, but I know him, and he's been in the ministry for decades. I think he's been in the ministry, I think, for um, a half a century now, all right? Maybe 40 years, 40 to 50 years. And it's entitled Forever Settled. It's an awesome poem that God's word is forever settled. This is what... Um, I'm just going to read a section of it. It says, I heard the old time preacher speak without one reference to the Greek. This precious book within my hand is God's own word on which I stand. And then the scholars came along and said the preacher had it wrong. Problems here, conflictions there, and scribal errors everywhere. Listen as it goes down. I'm going to pick up at the end. Then to the book again I fled to find out what my father said. Forever settled. Never fade. This promise God the Spirit made a thousand generations hence, that seems a pretty strong defense. A perfect book, then it must be. Man can improve what God gave me. We have a book completely true, instructing us in all we do, preserved by God, not found by men, inscribed by God the Spirit's pen. If God or scholars, you must choose, be sure the experts always lose. Don't give to them a second look, just keep believing this old book. God has given us a perfect book and you can trust your Bible.